there is also the Joyful Ladies and the Men's Fellowship, but this picture is not correct. They're not going to meet together. We will eat together at 3 o'clock on the 14th. And then the men will come in, in probably the conference room or in the uh, auditorium here.
If you say that with me here, 2 Timothy 1 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And this is so important, as the pastor was talking about this morning, about 2 Timothy 1.7. You know, if, when you think about the church here today, we have all the ability and everything that we have in Jesus Christ to do whatever God asks us to do and see the souls saved and born again. And we can have all that power and all the capability and the, all the love of Jesus Christ to do what it needs to be done to be able to reach souls today. And so... One of the things I thought about, you know, as I was praying and seeing what the Lord wanted me to preach about, and it says we need to first pray. First pray. And if you look with me in 1 uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, and it was in, when I was, and the first one was interesting, I was reading it, seeing over it, praying over it, and saying, all right, Lord, and what uh, Paul was writing to young Timothy, trying to help him through, uh, to help the church, to guide the church, uh, to do what needs to be done to uh, some of the problems and sin and, the, and doctrinal issues in the church. Uh, one of the things he said here in, in verse uh, 1 here, in chapter 2, is that he said that, that it basically said the first thing we need to do is we need to pray. I thought we, and in Timothy, the first thing you need to do to fix all this, we need to pray. Amen. Look at here, verse 1, it says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. We can help each other, but the first thing we need to do is pray. That's how we need to help each other. We need to pray for each other. We need to pray about how we need to help each other. We need to pray about all the things that we need to do, uh, even to help the lost community out in this area, to help those people out here. The only first thing we need to do is we need to pray. Uh, everyone needs to be encouraged. We need to encourage each other. Uh, the, the church needs to be encouraged as a body of believers. And this is only accomplished if we first pray. Timothy told, he said, Timothy, the first thing you need to do is we need to pray about these issues you got going on. We need to pray about how do we need to get this done and fixed and accomplished. A person that prays daily in a church that prays together will see mighty things that God can do in, in this area, in this church, and move it mightily if we can first pray about the things that we need to do. You know, we can see lives change from being destructive, productive. It was just like we said, we talked about that in the news where the, the uh, young man got himself shot by the cops today. Or well, this early this morning, pretty much. It was about five something this morning. It was a, a destructive life he was living. And because of the destructive life, that was the end result. What we need to do is we need to save those souls from going that way of destruction. But at first, we need to pray. And that's what I think is Paul was dealing with Timothy with a lot of the things that were going on in the church he dealt with in chapter 1 that we covered in chapter 1. And all the things that are going on there in chapter 1, he said, this is all the things I'm encouraging and telling you that we need to do, but we need, I need to exhort you first, we need to pray about this. Because men ain't going to get anywhere if we ain't going to mount it much. And God set up the church as a place of prayer. He set up the church as a place to encourage one another. He set up the church as a place to exhort one another. He set up the church as a place to proclaim truth, is what he said. He gave us. Look with me, and hold your place here, but go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And we're going to come back to Timothy in a little bit. But Hebrews chapter 10. And uh, in Hebrews chapter 10... The, the writer here, whether it's Luke or Paul, but the writer here made a, a, a great area here about talking about the church and what God is trying to do and wants the church to do and about this area of meeting together to do the work and what needs to be done for the church here. And so Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 19, he says this is having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. 
And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not have forsaken the assembly of ourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another as much more we see the day approaching. What we need to have is we find that he's encouraging him here. Paul is encouraging Timothy. We need to gather together. We know that we can gather together because we're gathered together into God's house. We're a body of believers around the Lord Jesus Christ. God has given us all power. He's given us everything we possibly need to do one thing. We need to provoke people unto love and good works. We need to encourage you to do the things that God has asked you to do. What does God want you to do from the Word of God? But we need to encourage you and provoke you to do it in love. And as we assemble together, this is what he, Paul was saying, that when we assemble together, we need to encourage and exhort one another. We need to uplift one another. And then what we need to do is that we need to pray together. We need to have that because we're not going to do much if we don't pray together. It tells us here that we, in exhorting one another, and then, you know the Bible tells us that in Mark 11, 17, it says, and he uh, taught, uh, saying unto them, it is not written, my house shall be called a, of all nations the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. You know, it's sad that the, the church is not doing what God has intended the church to do as he was instructed Timothy. That we need to encourage and exhort. We need to help lift. We need to guide. And we need to have intercessor or prayer here. We need to do all these things in order to see what God wants done in this area to be able to see souls saved. You know, I was thought about and I was praying about it this afternoon and and um, I don't know where this quote comes. It was, a, it was a quote that came in my head. It might be the one I made up in my head. I have no idea. But anyway, it was a, it, it, this thought came in my head. It says, you know, uh, prayer without action is nothing. Prayer with action can do something. And that's where it comes down. I said, well, I'll pray about it. And I said, okay. And, I, and you know, God said, good. You're going to pray about it, but what are you going to do about it? Because if you're concerned about it, enough to pray about it, then what are you doing about it? See, it's like, you know, like James would say, you know, faith without works is dead. I'll show you my faith by my works. And he said, well, hey, you know, Christ, you know, taught about there and says, you know, if a brother comes to you and, and he's destitute and naked and starving and hungry and he says, oh, hey, by the way, I'll just pray for you. Go ahead and go on your way. You've done nothing to meet the need of that person. And so when I think about this, in this first part here in Timothy, and then Timothy 1, in, in there in chapter 2, verse 1, he said, the first thing he says is that I exhort you. And I thought that that cut me there, because, you know, in that Timothy, in 1 Timothy here, 2, 1, he says in this, he says, I exhort thee therefore that first of all. And so it, it caught me here a little bit, as we're going to look here in Hebrews 10, but he tells us the first thing he says, I want to exhort you. And I thought about that word exhorting. And as we look at this word here and what God is saying about this word, and we looked at, I looked at Hebrews here, 10, 19 uh, to 25, he talked in the great length that the church is in a place of exhortation to members. I encourage you, I exhort you, I, I, uh, I uplift you in a way and says, okay, now I've given you everything you need to do. Go out there and find some people that we can help. That's what we're supposed to do. The word exhortation, oh, let me back up here. The word exhortation means this. Uh, strongly encourage or urge someone to do something. Now, Paul wrote to Timothy here. He says, I exhort you therefore. I strongly encourage, as a definition, or I urge you to do something. I strongly encourage you today. First, pray. I strongly encourage you today. First, pray. Pray about someone that needs to be saved. 
And I strongly encourage you first to pray and then ask, Lord, what can I do to help that person to be saved? There's a person that needs to go in the life of destruction that needs to now to go to a life of production. I need to pray for that person. Lord, first, I'm going to pray. I strongly encourage you to pray. Then you say, Lord, what have you to me to do to change that life from destruction to production? See, it's not, it's not going to happen overnight. And it's just because I prayed about it, all of a sudden, boom, magic wand is going to happen. God has left us here as a body of believers to do something. Okay? That's what he's left us here to do. We've got to find something to help these lives out here that are dying and going to hell. And so, you know, what is the church to do today? Well, the church is to do today is to exhort you. I'm going to exhort you. I'm going to encourage you. I am to urge you to do something for the glory of God. Paul strongly encouraged Timothy here. And as he encouraged him as a pastor to encourage that we need to do something, and as a Christian and members of a body of believers here today, we are here to do is encourage you and exhort you today uh, to get busy for the Lord, to and get busy for the Lord and to witness, to help, to pray, and to get involved. That's what we are to do. The only way that we're going to affect a life, a life, is to get involved with that life. Yeah. That's the only way that I can affect a life. And, and I'll tell you, it, it's not easy getting involved with a life to infect it, to make something and then product something out of that life to change that life from destruction to production. It takes sacrifice. It takes time. It takes prayer. It takes the power of God to do all that for you to get involved with a life. But we are here to get involved with a life. We're not here to be consumed with our life, but we are here to get involved with a life. He strongly encourages them and urges them that souls need to be saved. He strongly encourages them that, to help people to follow Jesus Christ with their life. Strongly encourages them to live more for Jesus Christ than themselves and the world. It is the exhortation and encouragement of those that are, who are saved and have a strong relationship with Christ. I encourage you. And I strongly exhort you to have a strong relationship with Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's going to move you. And he's going to motivate you. And he's going to do something with your life. And no different than I tell you, as I will tell anybody that I meet out in the street. I strongly encourage you to have a great relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's the one that's going to do the work that needs to be done in our life. You know, and I'll tell you what, it is a great thing to allow God to use you to affect another life. Yeah. To be part of something like that is grandeur. It is actually something that will affect all eternal value. And it's more than bigger than life itself. When we get a part of a life and we help a life or we affect a life, and then we see that life change from destruction to production, it is a grand thing to see something like that, to be part of something like that. Oh my, it, 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 it does something wonderful to you and your faith and to the glory of God to be able to be part of something like this. The exhortation that he had here is those who are saved in the Lord Jesus Christ and have a confidence, a place and home, you have, you have access to the holiest of all, the throne room of God. And by the, the blood of Jesus Christ, we have the right of this access. And to have a place and time in the presence of God. And man, I tell you what, it is nothing something like to take care of. And nothing something like to think of. You can go to God now being saved and have that blood access that you have to go there to the throne room of God. And I'm going to tell you this. He tells us to hold fast without wavering of this fact and truth that you can walk into the door room to the throne room of God even in the midst of your sin. You can walk in that throne room right now because you have the blood of Christ on you being saved and born again in the blood of Jesus Christ. We can walk in there and then ask God that we need help because we're, we're, we're struggling today. I need help in my marriage. I need help in my kids. I need a help maybe with this individual that I'm working with. But Lord, maybe i got to need help for myself because I'm in sin right now and I need you. And we have that access to walk in there. 
And he exhorts him and strongly encourages him that we have a place and we need to have a desire to get into the holiest place with God in our lives. We need that. We greatly need it today. I mean, and I, I tell you, was it um, thinking about the shooting and I was listening to the radio and, and listening to the news uh, down in Indianapolis. Uh, so far in the month of January, they've had 20 home homicides. Almost one a day. Almost one a day. That's crazy. Already at the beginning of the year. But where are those lives going when they die and part from this world? Where are they going? If they don't know Jesus, they're going to hell. <laughs> and you see the lives and people that you that are out in this world are living in shambles and dis and oh my, it's amazing some of the places I've been in here lately here in Marion talking to people and the lives that they're in and what they're going through. But we have the answers to all the problems of life and that's Jesus Christ. We have the answers. All we got to do is speak the answers. Pray. And if you ask God, say, Lord, I'm praying for this person and Lord, I'm praying, what have you do for me to do for this person to help them in this situation? Tell me, Lord, what you want me to do for them. I'll guarantee God's going to tell you. <coughs> you know, what are the, uh, what are you and the church are to do first? What are you and the church are to do first? And if you would turn back with me to 1 Timothy, back to 1 Timothy here, and look at 1 Timothy, and in 1 Timothy where we're at here in our text here, but I want you to look here, he says something here that he tells us, <coughs> in verses 1 and 2, he says this, I exhort you, therefore, that, and then that word therefore means everything I've talked to you in chapter 1, therefore, because I've said all this, now I want you to exhort you how to fix that in chapter 1. He says this, that first of all, supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Now, I, and, and when I was praying over that and what God had, you know, it reminds me that, you know, on Wednesday we are here and we part of our prayer is that we have, we say, is about, the, is about intercessory prayer. We are to intercessory prayer for one another. We come together, we pass out names of church members that we have, that means you all in that name that we pass out. Each one of you are on a card that we pass out, and we're praying for intercessory prayer for you on a Wednesday night. <coughs> the Lord will do something, or that Lord will intervene, or that maybe the Lord will maybe use one of us to help and intervene with you to help you with something. And we're directing our prayers in that way. But God is asking that we would have intercessory prayer. Prayer, uh, and I say this, is that Nothing will get done without prayer. Everything needs to be prayed over. That's, that's what is true. Everything needs to be prayed over. Nothing will get done without prayer. I found this quote here by C.H. Uh, uh, Spurgeon. Great power in prayer is within our reach, but we must go to work to obtain it. Prayer is actually very, it takes work. It takes work to pray. It takes work to get on our knees. It takes work to go over a list. It takes work to pray. It takes time uh, out of your day. It takes earnest concentration to really get into the throne room of God to pray. It takes work to do this. All brothers and sisters in Christ need prayer. The church itself needs prayer. Souls lost and dying go into hell, not saved in the blood of Christ, needs prayer. Amen. Our government needs prayer. Those who are in authority need prayer. That's what Paul told <coughs> Timothy in verse 10. Pray for the kings and those who are in authority. We got a, we got a huge authority problem in this country. And we were, Sharon and I were talking about that on the way in. 2020 just showed a great a, a lack of, a, 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 you want to say, appreciation for those who are in authority, like our police officers, our firemen, those who lay down their lives. They have lack of a, a appreciation and care for them. We need to pray for them. 
Well, that's what Paul's telling them that we need to pray. We, we're not going to be able to change on ourselves, but in effectual prayer, and that we will get into a prayer time, we can pray for our government and move our government, and God might even move us to affect our government and all those who are in authority, letting them know we're praying for them. Let the police know that we're praying for them and that we support them. Those who are in authority, we pray for them and we support them. That's what we're supposed to be doing as Christians here that we're supposed to do. And Paul's encouraging them to do this. Why should we pray over the, the saved? We ought to pray over our saved people. We need to pray that we encourage you as saved people to stay right with God and hold fast to profession of your faith. Why? And because it says without wavering. Why? Because people are wavering. Christians are wavering in their faith. Christians will not come to church anymore. Christians will rather have their home church or some other uh, lame thing, reason, excuse and not come in the house of God because they don't want to face up their, their accountability and their responsibility to the house of God. So they want to stay out so they don't have to be accountable and be responsible when someone preaches and says, hey, what are you doing for the Lord? Oh, I don't want to hear that anymore, so I'm going to stay home. You know, when we stay there before the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to ask him, so what you do for me while you're down there? You know, I, I don't want to hold my head in shame. I want to say, Lord, I tried my best. I did all I can. And that's what we that's all God asked us to do. He didn't ask us to do more than that. But you know, one of the things he says about this about prayer, that he how he directed this type of prayer, that we supplication, prayers, intercessions, giving thanks, be made for all men. And you know what he says, all men? That means all. Whether you're saved or not saved, you pray for those people. And then he says, why the reason why we need to pray for all men and kings and authority is so that we can live peaceable lives. So we, in this community, when we go home, we can live in peaceable lives. Because why? Because we're praying and God's moving me to help in this area because of the prayer that I have so that we can live Peaceable. That's what God also God wants for us to do is live peaceable. And that was the whole answer to the wicked world that we live in. You want to affect the wicked world? Pray for them and then ask God, what can I do to help them? To see the truth of God, see their need of Jesus Christ, see their need that they're living a life of destruction and you can live a life of production because of the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of God. And all we got to say, Lord, I'm praying that you will move me to what I can do. That's what he's asking here, and Paul's telling him to do. The word supplication comes from a Latin word, a Latin verb. Uh, it, it means supply care. Supply care is what it came from. And what it means is that to plead humbly. So supplication basically comes down to is supply care. I am to supply care for you. And so if I'm asking to pray for supplication and I'm humbly and pleading humbly for a supply care, that means I'm asking for some care for some people. Yeah. And God says, well, why aren't you doing it? I'm asking for care for somebody and I'm praying, Lord, you provide supply care for that somebody. And God's going to say, okay, what are you doing about it? I'll send somebody, but what are you doing about it? And that's, a, that's something we need to have and apply to our life. And and then to apply in the situation is basically what it comes down to is that you must entreat someone in power for help or ask in favor. So when I'm asking God and I'm praying in my supplication or in my supply care and I'm humbly asking God, what I'm saying is I'm asking God who is in power for help or asking God for favor. And so when you give supplication to God, what are you asking Him for? Are you asking God for help? Or are you asking God for to a supply? Or asking God to have favor? And God says, okay, I can't do it. But this is what God has left us here through ministry. He's left us here and says, good, I'm going to use you to do this. Because He can send an angel to down and do all the work. I mean, He can. And sometimes I wish He would because my back is hurting. I mean, my knees are killing me. You know? <laughs> no, I'm but, you know, all those things like that, you know, God says that's what he left us here for in these areas. And then everything that in life needs to come down to prayer. I don't care how small it is. 
How big it is? Oh, I, if, if I say, well, hey, I was trying to fix something and all of a sudden I lost it. Now I need to start praying. I say, Lord, where is it? I can't find it. Or, Lord, I need to get this fixed. <coughs> my car stopped working. I think Debbie was doing that. My car stopped working. I need to pray about it. God took care of it. Gloriously, he took care of it. She didn't have to pay a dime, but give a pie out. That was it. I mean, I could do that. I could bake a pie. Man, that would be great to have to pay a couple hundred dollars. I could do that. And I could give a whole stack of pies that way. But, you know, if you pray about those things in life, God can move and God can do. But we got to believe that God can do it. God, all God wants is our attention, that we show our dependency on Him. And then we show that God, if you say and you ask, I will do for you. Too often when we're praying, God lays on our heart, well, okay, this is what I want you to do. And they're like, no, no, God. Send somebody else. No, no, no. Not me. Somebody else. No, no, no. I'm praying, Lord. That means I'm praying that you send somebody else. And we're arguing with God in prayer when we're praying about something. No, no, no. God might say, I need you to get up and do something. And that's what it comes down to. And that verse he says as he goes in there and he talks about supplications. And then he says prayers. And he gives it as a plural and multiple and continual. That multiple continual that he tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Multiple prayers. That means I don't pray just once over the situation. I pray until that situation is resolved. I pray until that person goes from destruction to production. I pray with multiple prayers, and by multiple prayers, until this is resolved, I continue praying over that. Because sometimes God wants to see how long we're going to pray about it, because maybe he's already working our heart, and he says, that you're, you're, you're not moving, so keep praying. Keep praying. I'll then, when you get to the point where you finally hear me, then I'll move. That's what God's probably, probably telling us, why we're saying, wait, why is this not working? Well, maybe God says, well, I'm trying to tell you, get up and do it. I don't know. Maybe. Intercession. He gives another thing. He talks about intercession. The word intercession means action of intervening on behalf of another. So if I'm saying my prayers, I'm intervening on the behalf of another, praying that someone else will take care of them or that I might be able to take care of them. And I think sometimes when we get intercession and prayer and we're praying on behalf of another person, Maybe God might say that we might. this might be a good way to how you physically help somebody by saying, hey, I need an intercessor. And God says, good. I need someone to go intercess. You know, when some other people might be praying for lost, their lost family around here, you know, I pray that I got lost family in New York, and I'm praying that God will send a soul winner to them. I imagine maybe some people have some lost family members around here that, God's, that they're praying that God will send a soul winner to their families here in Miriam. And who we are, we're the soul winner. <laughs> if I'm expecting that in New York, I'm pretty sure that God is also expecting that here too. And so we need to pray for that. Pray that God will give us something that we can do. And then he tells us about giving thanks. Because see, when Paul was in here, and he was telling Paul and Timothy, you're going through a lot in here, but the one thing that every time we go through something in life, we've got to give thanks in the good and the bad. Because we learn a lot of things. But then through those times, sometimes we think these are bad times. But sometimes through those bad times, God gives a mighty work. And so he says, give thanks. Thanks is basically this. Give an adoration, praise, showing appreciation for what we have up, and what we have, and uplifting God for who he is. And so when we give God thanks, we're going to say, Lord, thank you for what we have. I'm giving you, I'm up, giving you adoration. I'm uplifting you for who you are. And Lord, as a church and as an individual, I need to praise you for all these things. And, um, and I thought this was interesting because he said at the end of verse 1, he says, be made for all men. Now, a lot of times you'll find in scriptures, they'll, they'll define what man he says. Sometimes he says, for all brethren, that are talking about the saint. He didn't say that here. He said, for all men... We are to pray these things. If someone asks you to pray, you pray for what they ask you to pray for. When I go online and I talk to people online, and I ask them, the, and I, and I um, message everybody that I can reach in this area, probably from the outlining towns, uh, even all the way up to upland, I'll message people back and forth. And what I'll ask them is that, can I pray for you? And they'll give me things to pray for. And I'll tell them, I, I, and I write back, it says, I prayed over this for you. 
And I will pray for exactly pray for. And I'll do it right there on the spot. And I'll tell them right then and there, I just got done praying for this that you asked me to pray for. And then I and I pray that, the, and I'll say, I say, I also pray that the Lord will draw you closer to Him. <coughs> and then sometimes I might be able to get a response back. Sometimes it starts me out with a good conversation with them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And those are the things that we pray for all men. Everyone desires to be prayed over. I rarely, maybe uh, all the people I've talked to, um, I'm, I think I'm around, I don't know, three, three or 4,000 people right now I'm talking, you know, I've had on my Facebook. You know, out of all those, I've maybe had maybe a, a, a percent or less than a percent that said, no, I'm not interested, don't bother me. Other than that, everybody else says, hey, pray for this, pray for this, pray for this, pray for this. And, and through those things and, and those do what we're doing, you know, we need to pray for the good of for these people, not for the evil of these people. Some of these people that I deal with, they might not be the, the, the nicest crowd of people, but they do need prayer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? They do need prayer. And I know when I got saved when I was 27, I wasn't the most nicest person, okay? <laughs> and most of you who got saved later in life, you knew who you were, okay? And these people need prayer, even if they're not saved, they don't know Christ, and then if they're living a, a wicked life, but they ask you to pray, you say, look, I will pray, and I will tell you I pray. And I, a lot of times I'll go back, and, and I've, I've got a list of people that I keep track of, and I'll go back and say, hey, did, how did God answer that prayer? Did they that prayer get an answer? I'll answer back, hey, did you get that job? Because someone will ask me, hey, can you pray that I get a job? And I'll say, okay. And they'll say, I got an interview. And I'll say, okay, I'll pray for your interview. And I'll say, hey, did you get that job? Did that happen? Did that work for you? And what we need to do is we need to pray first. And, and I think about it, it's not, and, and, and he's talking about this pray for all men. And, it's, and, and man today is all about that they, they think God is just an idea or God is a religion. What we need to show them, God is more than just that. But we as believers need to show that God is more than that. God answers prayers. God cares about your prayer. I care about your prayer because God cares about your prayer. We need to show that God answers. we, we got to show that we have confidence in God, that God will answer your prayer because I'm praying for it because I have confidence that God will do something in that area. And we need to have that prayer time in this area with God has. As a church, it needs to ask God humbly, and through the Holy Spirit, that will move and empower our ministry. And the church needs a place of prayer. Needs to be a place of prayer. We need known as a place of prayer. And we need to know that we are a praying church. And if someone needs to pray or need to come, they know that I need to go there because that's a house of prayer. I need to go there because those people pray. I need to go there for help because I know that they will help me. I need to go there because I know that I can get my spiritual needs and also I can give intervention at that place on behalf of me and others because these people believe in God and God moves in this place. we got to show that. It was interesting, a verse here in uh, Acts 4.31. It says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And so the book of Acts there, they were praying, they got down, and they prayed and prayed, and they prayed so earnestly, and the house felt was shaken because they were so involved in their prayer that it shaked and to the point that the Holy Ghost came upon them, and they were speaking, and we would say, the word of God boldly, how great God is. And that's what we need to get back as a church and as an individual, that we need to get into a prayer time that we're really seeking God, being filled with the power of God, the Holy Ghost, praying daily in our lives, having a, a time of prayer, and that God will give me power, He will give me protection, He will give me provision to be able to do the ministry that God has called us all to do, is to reach lives and souls to save them from going from the pits of hell to the place of heaven, take their lives from going down to destruction, to turn them into something being productive for God and as a productive citizen. Because, you know, one of the big things we have, we have a, uh, we have a lot of lack of productive citizens here. No one wants to work. 
No one wants to be accountable. Everybody wants to loaf off the government and, and get a free ride. And, in, and the lack of authority is getting worse and worse for each generation because we're indoctrinating our, our children that it's okay to be like this. They need a lot of prayer. We need to pray. We need to get down and pray for these. And we need to have a place that we get down and see the ground and the world and, the, and this <coughs> place shaken by the power of God. We can even have that in our own home and see that place shaken in our own home because we got alone with God. Because we have access in the, in the blood of Christ. We have access in the throne of God. And so as he tells us this in verse 2, as we pray for these things, and as we pray for the kings, and we pray for the authorities, and we pray for all men, is it so that they can live, and it says, so that we may live a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. And there's where the key comes into. You want to help yourself. I say, I want to, I want to, be in, I want to have peace in this community. Well, it starts with me. It starts with me to pray for this community and pray for the souls of this community. It starts with me to live godly before this community that they might see someone that is actually a true Christian. It starts with me to be honest with the world that's about out there and who I am, honestly, that I am a saved, born-again Christian that loves the Lord Jesus Christ and they ought to honestly see that, uh, who I am that I might be able to help them to live a peaceful life. It, it, the, you look at families that are, that are struggling and don't go to church. They don't live peaceably. There's a lot of turmoil. There's a lot of going on. You can look at the face of, of the people that are, are not living for Jesus Christ. They don't barely you know, say boo at the church door. And you can tell their face is not peaceable. They're stressed. They're anxieties. They got depressions. They, they, they're suicidal. They're crazy. They're led by themselves and they're led by the devil. They have no peace. No peace. And the only peace that we can give them is the Lord Jesus Christ. And what Paul said to Timothy, first you need to pray. Before you do anything else, before you start fixing these problems that you found in church one, and because he says, therefore, what I've told you in chapter one, for you to fix these problems, you need to pray. You need to pray for the, the city that we're having, this area, that we're in Ephesus, that we have a lot of uprising. Because the church of Ephesus was a very pagan town. And they had a lot of problems when Paul went through there because he shook it up about their paganism. He said, what we need to do, we need to pray for the, those who are in authority in this town that we as a church can live peaceable in this town with the people. But also that we be able to affect them for the gospel of Jesus Christ. All we need to pray first. And so we need to pray first. And that's one of the great things we need to do. We need to pray. Before we do anything else, pray. You want to see your families fixed? Pray. Pray. Pray, pray, pray. And then you ask God as you pray, Lord, what do you have me to do to help my family, my friends, and whoever else I run across? What would you have me to do? How can I help them? Because, like I said, prayer without action is nothing. Prayer with action is something. And that's what God wants us to do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will just bless the message. Lord, I, I pray that we will get something out of Paul. What he told Timothy, what he first needs to do is first pray. I pray, Heavenly Father, you'll guide us, help us, Heavenly Father, to take some of this home and, Lord, chew on it a little bit, try to understand it, and, Lord, how to uh, help affect us in such a way that we might be able to affect others <laughs> and be able to affect this community and those who are around us, Lord, to change lives from being destructive to productive, to change these lives who are on their way to hell. Help us, Heavenly Father, to find ways to reach them for Jesus Christ. Lord, I do thank you and praise you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.